Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us tonight for Accelerate Yale's webinar um, in partner with Yale Fin. Um, the title of our webinar today is The Future of FinTech, Trends and Opportunities in Lending. And I'm really excited to have Matt Levinson and Jason Gus on the phone with us, uh, on, on the webinar with us today, um, who, who are gonna really ha have a really dynamic discussion. Um, Matt is class of 2010 and a principal of FinTech Collective. FinTech Collective is a venture firm focused on early stage investments in companies that are reimagining the way money flows through the world. Matt's a fantastic investor who has led investments in Opryless and Flutterwave, as well as being deeply involved in FinTech Collective's investments in Moneyline and Plaid. In addition, Matt's firm was the seed investor in Octane back in 2016. And that brings us to Jason, Yale class of 2012, who founded Octane only two years out of college with the goal of making power sports lending as easy as cash. He's grown Octane significantly into the leader in the power sports lending market through direct relationships to OEMs and other industry participants. And you know, this is a really great example of what we're trying to build um, at Accelerate Yale and Yale Angels. Um, Yale is connecting with each other um, being in, in, one being an investor in the other's company, and also, you know, as you'll see from, from their webinar, um, the two of them becoming really close friends. So with that, um, I will let Matt and Jason take it away. Thanks so much, Jason, and thanks to the Accelerate Yale community for having us today. I'll start by giving a quick introduction of myself, and we'll segue into, into Jason's background uh, momentarily. Um, but quickly, just to introduce my firm, FinTech Collective, uh, we are building a, a leading early stage FinTech focused venture capital fund uh, here in New York City. Uh, we're currently investing out of our third fund, um, which is well over $150 million. Um, and we are focused on early stage, which is typically seed or series A, investing checks that can range anywhere from one to $10 million. Uh, and we invest across the breadth and depth of fintech. That includes banking, lending, payments, wealth and asset management, capital markets, insurance, um, as well as digital assets and blockchain. Um, my quick personal background, I graduated from Yale in 2010. I studied sociology and economics. I've always been fascinated in investing. Uh, I got my first Apple shares pre-iPhone and my first Tesla shares in 2012. Uh, and that got me hooked on, you know, how can you build big impactful technology companies? Uh, I knew I wanted to be an investor. I spent the first five years of my career in private equity, uh, where I learned a tremendous amount and also have had to unlearn a tremendous amount uh, moving into the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Uh, after private equity, um, I had a stint as an entrepreneur. I co-founded a startup um, providing drone services and technology. Uh, we worked on the movie Fast and Furious 8, the television show Billions, car commercials, things of that nature. Uh, and I joined FinTech Collective about four and a half years ago. Uh, and our firm is really scaling tremendously. And I think a, a lot of great things to come for FinTech Collective. Um, and I'll tee it up for Jason, just a quick background. You know, we invested in Octane back in 2016. Um, so in five short years, you know, Jason, you've built a company, your run rating around $675 million of loans per year. Um, you're doing tens of millions in annual revenue operating cash flow positive, and you've raised over $140 million of equity and $600 million of debt. So it's been a pleasure to work with you um, and just see the growth of Octane and you, frankly, as an entrepreneur. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to you. And, and it'd be great to sort of tell your story and, and give, give everyone, everyone your background. Absolutely. So I graduated from, uh, from Yale in 2012. I was in GE. And out of college, I worked at Capital One, where I was in the corporate strategy group. So we were the in-house consulting arm, and we do different strategy projects that would be similar to what you're doing if you're doing external consulting. And one day, um, one of my my future co-founder had done a rotation in the power sports group. So power sports are motorcycles, ATVs, UTVs, which are side by sides, things like golf carts, snowmobiles, and jet skis. And you know, effectively, just like the car world. All these items are purchased at the point of sale through dealerships that sell these items in the same way that car dealerships sell cars. And just like in the auto industry, 70, 80% of purchases are actually financed depending on the asset. And so consumers are really transacting through financing. And just like the auto world, you receive your financing through a finance manager at the point of sale as opposed to going directly to your bank. And one day, um, you know, I'd done a lot of work in the auto finance space. Um, I say a lot, my first year out of college, um, and 
I, you know, my future co-founder went up to me and said, look, you know, we have um, all these, these financing options for these power sports dealers, but the dealerships appear to be applying one at a time through various websites to get financing for the customers. Is that how it works in the auto space? And, you know, I, I didn't really think too much about it because in the auto space, you have these great aggregators where you could submit a single application as a finance manager and get a tremendous amount of uh, funding offers back without having to rekey. And I actually found myself at, I was staffed on a project in Seattle about a month after that. And I was having dinner with a, a, a good friend from Yale um, who also graduated in 2012, uh, who was also a founder, a uh, serial founder with other Yaleys actually. Um, and we were just talking at the time he had worked at this company called Redfin, which is a tech brokerage firm. Um, and you know, he was talking about how he wanted to start a company in an industry that was overlooked by institutions but had real business problems that could te uh, that technology could solve. And so then I remembered, well, actually, there's this problem that we faced at work uh, where maybe the solution might be very powerful. And so and it kind of that was kind of the Eureka moment. I was like, I, I should really go ahead and do this. So three weeks later, I quit my job, moved out to Seattle. And, um, you know, I, I started kind of building out uh, the, the business logic for, for, for Octane. But before I really committed to you know, solving the problems of the power sports lending market. Um, Dan and I reached out to almost 100 people off the Yale alumni network, and we asked three primary questions. What do you hate most about your job? What are the biggest inefficiencies in your market? And what will you pay me to build for you? And we talked to people across all sorts of different industries. We came up with a list of about five ideas that we found really compelling to be uh, for a startup. And we applied for funding for all five of them. Uh, and you know, given what I know now, thank God the power sports idea is the one that got picked up for venture funding. Um, and we, we moved out shortly thereafter to, uh, to, um, to Austin where we did our kind of initial incubator. And um, just like on all incubators, it's kind of get funding or fail or die or, or go back to a, a kind of full-time job. And uh, at the end of the incubator, uh, we had some leads for funding, but we had nothing in the back. And the biggest problem that we faced is that our market uh, is pretty esoteric, and it's a problem that if you're on the coast, you might not even aware, you might not even be aware of this market exists. Um, and so we kept having issues where the venture firms just said, "Yeah, this seems interesting, but I know nothing about this market," and they passed. And so I must have pitched over a hundred firms, all said no. Um, and you know, I, I talked to this insurance company who was in the motorcycle space, and they understood the problem, and you know. Didn't think too much about it. And I actually had started reapplying for jobs because you know, incubator was over, we didn't have any money and needed to start making income again. And while I was kind of interviewing again, uh, I get this call from this unknown number and it's the insurance company like, we're gonna write you a half million dollar check uh, to start building your platform. And so uh, that's kind of how we got into business at the end of 2014. And we started, our initial product was a lender aggregator, basically a solution to enable dealers to apply through a single, uh, single source applied to multiple lenders uh, from a single technology. And then we also built a loan origination system, which is an underwriting platform that we were using to attract banks to our marketplace. And so we ended up raising about a million and a half. And within you know, six weeks, our business case was cracked. We realized that this business would not work. The problem was that although there was this need for this marketplace, there were too few lenders in the space and the space was too small. So basically you had this issue where the lenders weren't interested in updating their experience. So if you were a manual underwriter, you were uninterested in, in updating and becoming automated and digital. Or if you only did prime lending, you only want to do prime lending, you didn't want to do kind of the full spectrum. So there, there just was kind of this issue where the lenders in the space just truly understood the market and we weren't going to make enough money and the sales cycle was too challenged to actually make a lender marketplace work. And so at that point, we realized that we actually needed to use the technology that we had built to power our own originator to actually serve the market. And that's actually where we met FinTech Collective. And so Contour and, and um, the insurance company, Rider Insurance, kind of led our, our seed. And then as we were pivoting in, FinTech Collective came in. We were actually, I believe, their last check out of their first fund uh, to help kind of bridge us uh, to, our, uh, to, to basically uh, finance the pivot to, to transform ourselves from a pure software business to a hybrid business where we are a software company that powered an originator. That's really great feedback. Um, one thing you mentioned is that many people don't understand this market and it's es esoteric and might assume it's small. Um, I'd be curious if you could frame how big is this market, what percentage of it is financed and how much of it have you, have you captured? 
Absolutely. So one, one thing, I'll kind of stepping back a bit, the way that we talk about the business day, we don't talk about ourselves as a power sports lender. We refer to ourselves as an end-to-end -end purchasing platform focused on passion purchases. So passion purchases are you know, anything that you don't need to survive, but bring you joy. So we try to enable joy by making transactions much, more, much easier and much more accessible to consumers. And we also try to help consumers find the perfect thing for them. And the reason why I, I kind of talk about that, because that's if you see any of the stuff that we talk about today, or you ever hear from us from an investor or see anything, that's how we talk about our business. In fact, we don't usually mention power sports usually. And the reason why I bring that up is I think people misunderstand how large their actual opportunity is. So everyone knows the example of Uber where their initial market opportunity, I think, was $2 billion, or at least that's what they thought. And now they do multiples of that in revenue. And so it was kind of a very similar story for us where we started out with this very small idea that over time actually evolved into a much broader opportunity. But all of that said, basically, um, you know, in my opinion, there are kind of two major areas in lending. You have the marquee markets that literally everyone has heard of. These are mortgage, uh, small business lending, uh, unsecured consumer, student lending, auto lending, and there's a couple other categories. Basically each one of these about a trillion dollars in outstandings, hundreds of billions in annual originations. And literally, if you had to chart every single venture backed company in FinTech you've ever heard of, plus every single bank you've ever heard of, plus all the local lenders and captives, et cetera, et cetera, all chasing after this. So you have billions and billions of dollars of venture capital going to these marquee markets. And then you have the spaces that we go after, the passion purchase space. Each one of these are about 20 to 50 billion, so materially smaller. But the key difference is they're so underserved that you have the opportunity to get an outsized share and actually provide value to the market. So in spaces where you have 15 people going after it, your ability to add unique differentiate value to the participants of the market is much lower than if you were the only one disrupting the space. And so even though each one of our markets is only 20 to 50 billion, which by the way is quite a bit, we have the opportunity to actually grab multiple billions of that as opposed to if we were in the mortgage market, success would be 1% we could actually grab 20% of a market. And then also because it's so underserved, uh, the value that we're adding to markets materially higher, meaning that our opportunity to get, uh, achieve profits also higher because we're adding more value and they're usually correlated. And so not only yeah. can we get a much larger share, which enables us to get the billions of dollars in originations, each origination we, we, we do ends up being far more profitable because we're getting subsidized by manufacturers and other, other folks where we're helping kind of create incremental sales. Yeah. I'd love to unpack the Octane strategy just a little bit. Uh, we're in a very interesting market environment where we'll get to in a bit where all of a sudden you have credit forward businesses that are inc incredibly valuable. You've got a firm which has gone public, $30 billion market cap. Klarna was valued at $10 billion. Afterpay, I think, is $35 billion. Um, and then you have a bunch of the mortgage lenders going, going public as well and doing pretty well. Rocket, United Wholesale Mortgage. And so this theme of sort of point of sale, embedded distribution, people are waking up to the value of that as well as secured lending. And so I'm sort of teeing you up a little bit, but we'd love to just hear about sort of the strategy, like how you go to market and what does that mean for your customer acquisition and ultimately your unit economics? A absolutely. So our approach to the space is what we call the Octane flywheel, which is a three-pronged business approach. The first two parts of the business approach are more or less very similar to what other participants do. It's what I refer to as the table stakes for being a disruptor as a FinTech lender. The third one is unique to us. So the first thing we do is win by experience. So effectively, we are fully automated, fully digital, fully paperless. So this might shock you, but in many of these underserved markets, manual underwriting is pretty common. Paper contracts are pretty common. In fact, that's why Oculus can exist as a business. Um, and so effectively, we're able to get consumers to contracts um, in the same time that some of the largest lenders can render a credit decision in the prime space. And so we win by a much easier and faster experience. The second thing is we take that winning experience, we couple it with a superior credit offering. So in the markets that we go after, you tend to have a very disjointed financing landscape in that you have banks that just do prime and then a very underserved uh, non-prime space that's served by kind of a, a long tail of fragmented and backwards lenders. And the issue in those spaces is that you tend to have a tremendous amount of very good and deserving consumers who are locked out of bank funding. And whenever you're locked out of bank funding, you either one, can't get access to the loan or two, the loan is priced very unfairly. And so we see an opportunity to provide 
full spectrum coverage. The way that we describe it is we offer the same prime competitive financing the big banks do, and we supplement that with an extra 40 to 50% of a non-prime coverage uh, in kind of honest and uh, kind of competitive, uh, competitive structures, which enables us to expand access to deserving incredible consumers um, who, who, can, who can afford the, these goods. And one of the things that people kind of mistake is that um, you, know, you, you might say, why would you even offer a non-prime coverage to uh, a consumer getting a, a, a good that, that's for joy? Um, you have to understand that credit scores are not synonymous with capacity. Uh, in fact, you know, our consumers tend to have very high income, long job tenures, for whatever reason, they had a hiccup in the past and they're trying to get back on, uh, you know, back on the tracks. And so enabling them to get access to much cheaper credit products, not only are we able to see very strong credit performance, but they are very exceptionally deserving, which is something that generally gets lost when people think about um, you know, lending in the near prime space, um, which I'm sure uh, you could attest to in the money line. Uh, there's plenty of de extremely deserving consumers who, who we need to lift back up so they could get back to prime. Yeah. Um, and then that those two elements, kind of the spirit credit and experience, every single fintech disruptor has done that for their respective vertical. But once again, yeah. it's table stakes. You have to do that. Otherwise, you don't have a chance. The third thing we do is unique to us. And this is what I call end-to-end -end purchasing. So from the moment you think and realize I need this good to figuring out the perfect one for you to the financing at the point of sale, all the way on the servicing where you're paying back on your loan to your second transaction, we want to be able to provide the consumer and the merchants a seamless transaction. And the reason why this is unique is that today in all the spaces that we go after, each part of the consumer purchase journey is served by a different provider. And so not only is there an opportunity for us to provide one, one experience from end to end, which is superior, faster, and easier, because each part of the journey is currently served by a different provider, there's a series of different and distinct revenue streams that we can exploit to subsidize our product elsewhere meaning that not only can we provide a superior experience, we can offer a far cheaper product to both consumers and merchants that get a kind of benefit from us doing it all. Um, and that's kind of an end purchasing platform. Um, you know, it's been driving a lot of our kind of innovation and focus over the last year and kind of on, on the look forward. Um, and it's able to succeed because we have this great credit and experience foundation that we were building over the last several years. That's phenomenal. Um, and it's clear to me, at least, that the um, full spectrum lending, as well as um, fully embedding the transaction and covering the transaction, has a strong value proposition with dealers. That's why I think you've penetrated 25 or 30 percent in your initial market, you know, motorcycles, power sports, UTV, ATV. Um, what does the future of Octane hold, right? So clearly, you know, you're originating 700 million a year, there's 20 billion just in that initial market to go after per year, and 80% of it is finance. Um, but 10 years from now, and on your on your march to building a multi-billion dollar, decabillion dollar company, um, which I know that you're on, um, what does that look like? What's the future vision? And, and where does this company go in 10 years? A absolutely. So in the short term, um, you know, there are about 20 to 30 passion purchase markets that we want to expand to. And when you add up all of them, it's in kind of call it the two to three hundred billion dollars in annual sales. And we want to be able to get all of them. And kind of the features of these markets are five to 50K purchases. So high ticket, there's an asset behind them. So even though vacation is a passion purchase, brings you joy, because there's no collateral there, that's not a market we would go after. And the reason why we want to focus purely on secured is those are the markets that are most underserved where we could add the most value to consumers and merchants, right? Other markets already have venture capital going after them. Let those folks add value there. We wanna add value to the markets that are overlooked and missed. Um, and so kind of, kind of backing up, where does all this get to us? So let's just say we get into all of these passion purchase markets. What have we done? So if you look at a firm, you look at Afterpay, you look at Klarna, you look at all these businesses, everyone is trying to create the platform where the consumer actually goes to for their purchase, right? That's eventually what you wanna do. You kind of wanna replace the credit cards. Um, and you see all of those companies I just mentioned, which are the ones that have gone public or are about to go public. Um, and they're all focusing on kind of the low ticket size. And the reason why they're doing this, it's obviously a very large opportunity. And what they're trying to build is a network of consumers and a network of, of merchants. And the reason why those two parts are important is the more consumers you have, the more opportunities that you have to provide incremental sales or privileged access to merchants, 
And the more merchants you have, the more opportunities you have to provide uh, greater discounts and other services, uh, preferred access to goods to those, cons those same consumers. And so by rolling up all of these kind of low ticket markets, you know, theoretically, if you fast forward five, 10 years from now, a firm could be the platform where if you purchase through them instead of your credit card, you might be able to get 10, 15% off whatever per you're purchasing because it's truly an incremental sale for that merchant partner. While at the same time, you might also be able to get access to a good before it's released or some other you know, material value add that consumers care about. The way that we're approaching it's kind of the opposite. Instead of rolling up all these low tickets where five or 10% might be five or 10 or 15 bucks off a purchase, right? If you think of Afterpay, I believe their average transaction is about 150. So if you're getting 10% off, that's about 15 bucks. Now, a firm's closer to 600, but I believe that the, over time, my guess is that they'll keep going lower, similar to Klarna and Afterpay. For us, we've taken the opposite approach. All of our perch, our average uh, ticket price is almost 12K and it's expected to go up as we keep entering more and more of these markets. And the reason why I think that's actually an interesting approach to this problem is when, if we are able to get five or 10% off for our consumers, that could be literally thousands of dollars. And so, because whichever path you're on and you wanna replace credit cards and be kind of the future, whatever path you're on, you need to be able to change consumer behavior. And to change consumer behavior takes the need for radical value deliverance. People like to talk about the 10X experience, it's kind of similar to that. And in our opinion, offering five, 10, 15 bucks off a purchase, although it sounds nice, in practice, I think it's gonna be challenging to actually break consumer habits. Whereas we think the opportunity of going after these large ticket spaces might provide that actual ability for us to change consumer behavior by offering kind of unprecedented value to consumers that they actually care about, while at the same time providing those merchants with far more sales than they could have gotten otherwise. So providing value to all sides of the marketplace. Yep. Um, that's an exciting vision. I'm, I'm can't wait for the future of, of Octane dominating uh, point of sale, embedded distribution, secured lending for a number of these overlooked markets in the future. Um, and for those listening who might be wondering about credit, um, I'll just say there's a pretty tremendous spread between Jason's cost of capital and um, uh, sort of the interest income and revenues that he's generating. But I actually want to go to, um, since I know we're running a little short on time and we want to get to questions, um, let's talk about COVID for a second. Um, so COVID obviously turned the world upside down in 2020, tremendously difficult from a health perspective, psychological perspective, and from an economic perspective. Um, when it comes to Octane, you know, one thing I've tried to be helpful with for you, and you don't need much of my help, but one thing I try to be helpful with is getting you introduced to some growth equity investors, um, and a number of you whom who passed and are probably kicking themselves today. Um, and, and what they would have said pre-COVID um, was, oh, in the next downturn, lending businesses won't fare well, credit quality will decrease, delinquencies will go up, and I'm just worried about you know, the next severe downturn. We saw a pretty severe shock in 2020. Um, so tell, I think everybody would be fascinated to hear your story and how did you handle COVID? How did you adjust your strategy? How did you adjust the business? But also what were the results? you know, how did the loans perform? How did you grow through it? Absolutely. So stepping yeah. back, when you think about preparing yourself as a, as a business that has lending exposure uh, for downturns or shocks to your performance, it's really about loss coverage and understanding the possible volatility. So loss coverage is the multiple of losses that you can absorb before your unit economics turn negative. And so almost always, with the exception of fraudulent underwriting, which we had in the financial crisis, but with the exception of that, lenders almost never go out of business because the interest income is outweighed by losses. It almost never happens. Uh, you would have to be really incompetent for that to occur. What is much more likely that drives you to go out of business is you face what's called a liquidity crunch. And so, so long as you understand the, you know, basically you have the loss coverage, right? So you're able to absorb the shocks. You understand what the volatility can be and you have sufficient liquidity and you're not running over levered, that's kind of the formula to running a business that can withstand shocks. And in our asset, we underwrite to usually in normal times a 2X loss coverage. In the COVID period, we increased that to 2.5 to three. And I'll get more into specifically what we did in COVID. Um, I kind of setting the stage here a little bit, but our portfolio ends up running usually about three on actual performance. Um, because usually what ends up happening, our cost of funds have gone down way faster than we thought. We have very low acquisition because we're embedded at point of sale. 
uh, and we have these manufacturer subsidies and we're actually able to uh, underwrite and price these assets appropriately because we're on a direct to consumer channel where it's a race to the bottom. And so what people should really be looking at is whether or not you can withstand the multiples of loss. What, what is the volatility? Whether or not your assets can withstand the, the you know, you have the sufficient loss coverage. And then are you running the business with sufficient liquidity so that you don't face a liquidity crunch? And so going straight back to COVID, uh, let's put ourselves back in late March, 2020. Unemployment skyrocketing, the securitization market, frozen, no new issuance. In the secondary markets, things are trading at, at discounts not seen since the financial crisis, okay? People are freaking out. So liquidity is basically drying up. So what did we do? Well, preparing the business pre-COVID, we run the business to the point about loss coverage I already talked about, but on the liquidity side, we always run the business to have sufficient capital so that if we were unable to securitize, we'd be able to run the business with no problems for 12 to 18 months. So we always have extra cash lying around. Second thing, diversified funding sources. We have multiple warehouse lines. So if one warehouse line went, went, goes stops, which we actually had happen uh, in COVID, Unrelated to us, they just stopped funding their entire North American portfolio. No problem. We had three other warehouse lines. Um, we also have multiple mezzanine less, uh, lenders. We had one mezzanine lender who, once again, also unrelated to us, just had couldn't fund us, as they were facing uh, basically margin calls elsewhere in the portfolio. Uh, you know, thank you, mortgages. Uh, and basically, uh, but who cares? We had two other mez lenders who were there for us. Um, and basically what we did, the, th the three things that we did is one, grab the cash, fortify liquidity. So we immediately raised another $25 million of equity capital. We also run our business such that we, we aim to securitize every time our assets are over $200 million, which means the book at any time is very low. So going into COVID, our, our, our assets on our sheet were, you know, we, we had maybe 60 million bucks on sheet which we, we, the cash that we had against that is just, it, it's kind of laughable how low the leverage is. Um, and then we also had multiple warehouse lines and then we just raised another $25 million immediately to, because we had no idea what was gonna happen. We needed the insurance capital for whatever might occur. Uh, next thing that we did on the fortified liquidity side is we upsized our existing warehouse lines and we switched the capital over from uncommitted to committed where it wasn't. So we already had most of our capital committed, wherever it wasn't, we, we got it switched to committed immediately. We then also upsized our parent debt. So we upsized it from about 18 million to about 36 million. So basically, not only do we grab $25 million of cash, we upsized our parent debt by another 18 million and we upsized all of our warehouse lines because we had no idea how long this was gonna last. And you know, all we could do was basically tell the story the best we can and hope that we have sufficient liquidity to kind of navigate the storm for as long as, the, uh, long as, as possible. Second thing we did, and these are done in parallel, is underwriting. So if we funded 100 people in February and those same 100 people came back to us in early April, we would have only funded 15 of them. Half of that was done through underwriting tightenings where we basically um, you know, increased down payments, um, you know, basically lowered our approval rate generally, uh, tightened capacity metrics. So people needed more, you know, better PTI, DTI, et cetera. Uh, tightened our proprietary model thresholds, uh, et cetera. And then we also shut down our riskiest programs. Uh, and then we focused our capacity on our partners. So we, similar to like a firm and other lenders, we have manufacturing partners. We have about 40 partners um, who subsidize our loan flow, but we also do lending for people who we're not partnered with. So we shut down all the programs for non-partners and we just focus capacity on where we were partners. So that was the other half. So half of it was we shut our use program. We stopped lending to people who weren't partners. And then the other half of the tightening was basically the underwriting side. The third thing that we did is uh, we, we basically went to go reassure our partners. So part of kind of saving capacity for our partners enable us to be there for our merchants and our manufacturers who are actually partnered with us. And it actually made the people who we weren't partnered with more excited about potentially partnering with us. And I'm proud to say that we didn't lose a single manufacturer partner uh, throughout the crisis. So while all that was going on, we started seeing the early signs that COVID was actually gonna be fine for us by call it early April. So we peaked on extensions on our book at about four, four and a quarter percent. And that might be, shock you that a recreational portfolio of prime and near prime assets. So our average FICO is about 700, so call it low prime, um, only had a 4% extension rate. 
whereas auto and other players were closer to 10% uh, unsecured consumer. And what actually happens makes sense if you look at the data. So in our space, we ran an employer concentration analysis in the middle of March. What we found is that restaurant, retail, hospitality only made up 5% of our employers. In addition to that, in the prime side, our average individual income, not household, individual, is over 100K. And then on the near prime side, it's over 80K. So if you look at the portion of the US which has been disproportionately affected by COVID um, from an employment standpoint, we were just fortunate this time around to have lower exposure. The financial crisis was actually the opposite for our asset. And so in the financial crisis, losses in the worst vintages were anywhere from 1.8 to about two and a quarter worse. Um, uh, you know, basically been a normal vintage, but that's because construction is the largest employer concentration we have. And construction was like the equivalent of retail hospitality in the financial crisis. And then also people were getting laid off in mass across all levels of the income spectrum. And so those two dynamics led to uh, kind of higher than expected loss to income for the consumers that, that just happened to borrow in our space. So the first thing you have to remember is what actually drives a default. It's not like people just default randomly. They, they stop being the person they were for the previous 45 years of their life overnight. That's actually not what happens. Usually people are defaulting when they, when they get a shock to income or have an unexpected cost that they, they just weren't expecting. So this time around, of course, it was a shock to income. Um, and you know, fortunately, even for lenders who have much higher concentrations to those groups I've said, for everyone basically except for small business, those people really took a, took a beating, unfortunately. Um, we're able to basically get a pass because the stimulus fortunately was very effective from a credit perspective. But in our space, the consumers just really aren't receiving stimulus in our, our, our space. So we actually saw no delta in performance when stimulus ended in Q4. Um, and I think it kind of makes sense, right? Our extensions were only 4% of the book. So even if those 4% reliant on extensions, uh, sorry, on, on stimulus, it wouldn't materially impact uh, kind of the overall book performance. Um, and the last thing I'll say on this is uh, we actually had our lowest delinquency rates ever and our lowest credit defaults ever last year. Um, and then at the same time, there's been a shift in consumer spending to our asset class. So now that consumers aren't spending multiple thousand dollars on family vacations, they're looking for fun things they can do at home. So in addition to e-commerce for buying Pelotons or home improvement, you also have people buying recreational vehicles and, and other passion purchases. Um, and so many manufacturers in our space were up to uh, you know, mid double digits year over year uh, in a space that normally grows mid to low single digits. Yep. That's incredible depth of analysis. And look, every, every crisis is different and every company handles it differently. Um, and uh, for the survivors, sometimes they come out stronger, but well, I'll say from an investor perspective, that sticks out apparently to me, and apologies if I'm saying too much about the business, but your delinquency and default rates did not go up astronomically. In fact, in fact, I think by May, they were at historical lows. That's right. Um, you grew tremendously. I think today you're an order of magnitude bigger than you were February of last year. Um, significantly bigger. To, people define order of magnitude differently, but you're significantly bigger. You've continued to originate, you've grown. And it's clear to me, um, the economics on your, on your product have been so strong throughout the entire crisis that this is an opportunity for you to play offense and, and go in the market, a market that I think you're already on your way to winning. What I'll say, the thing that surprises investors, so I remember when I was trying to raise the seed before the white knight in front of us, uh, but basically uh, they would always say, oh, in a recession, no, your sales are gonna go down, no one's gonna buy. And what I always respond is in a recession, I'm not gonna be able to say no fast enough. We literally every single week had an underwriting meeting where we're trying to figure out how to cut volume because it's liquidity that kills you. And so obviously knowing how things turned out, we, you know, we could have originated a billion dollars last year if we wanted to, but we didn't know that at the time. You have to make decisions what you had at the time, but that's exactly what happened. We had the highest demand we ever had. And as I mentioned, the underwriting tightening was about 85% of those 100 consumers in February, if the same people came back with the same stats in, in, at the end of March, early April, only 15 of them was getting funded. Despite that, we were still originating $36 million in the month of May. And so that's with an 85% tightening. So if we hadn't had that, the amount of originations we could have done would have been astronomical if we had been under normal underwriting, but it would have been the wrong move. 
Um, and so that's what people just kind of miss is that actually you get to cherry pick your, your originations because the supply of lender capital always drops more than the supply of consumer demand. More people would be asking for loans than lenders who are still in the market. And then usually what happens, it's very cyclical. The best years for a business that has lending exposure are the years after a recession because competition's at its lowest. And so yep. you're able to fortify your market position uh, and become dominant. Um, now, fortunately, in this case, uh, the stimulus measures have seemed to have averted some of the worst things that could have happened. Uh, and, you know, the, it looks like the recovery is much, much, much faster than what we saw after the financial crisis. Um, and so you might not see the exact same effect with lenders this time around, but it should directionally still be, uh, you know, the people who are still around who are well-funded should be in a very good position to grow. And that's exactly what we're doing this year. So our run rate right now is about 675. Um, we should originate just over 800 million this year. Next year, we expect to grow to about 1.4 billion. That's phenomenal. Um, I want to get to questions um, pretty quickly to make sure we have at least 20 plus minutes. Our last topic, which we were going to banter on, which maybe the Q&A will, will tee up further, but I'll just sort of make a quick statement on. Um, when it comes specifically to lending in, in FinTech, and it's what I would loosely describe as credit forward businesses, um, the space was under a bit of a cloud for a while. And the reason why was you had four, maybe five companies that went public and performed really poorly in the public markets. I'm thinking of Lending Club, On Deck, Green Sky, Elevate, and there's probably one or two others that are on top of mind for me. And those, those businesses were very different. Um, I'd say in general, they weren't differentiated on product. So they were competing on APR. Um, they were in really competitive lending markets with really tight margins, which is very different than what Octane is doing, unsecured lenders for the most part versus secured lending. And they didn't have proprietary customer acquisition channels, right? So you, you got a company like Lending Club pay, I don't know, a thousand, two thousand dollars to attract a, uh, a customer and that customer would take out a loan and never interact with Lending Club again. What you're seeing with the firm, Afterpay, Klarna, also, even the challenger bank, SoFi, Money Lion, would certainly put in that multi-product credit first bucket. Um, and, and Octane, you're seeing a very different breed of company, and they're now coming to the public markets. And look, we can debate all we want about valuations today, and are they too high, or are we in a bubble? But even if you put that aside, one thing that's really encouraging to me is in the public markets, you are seeing investors... Uh, discern and delineate high quality credit forward businesses from low quality um, credit forward businesses. And I think there was a FinTech 1.0 hype cycle where all these things were lending club and on deck were growing and they were valued at extreme multiples. That was probably too extreme. We then went under a cloud that I think was too extreme. Um, and I'm excited to see sort of the future of Octane and, and also this other cadre of companies and how they get valued and how they, how they perform. Um, Let's instead of banter that, I think maybe let's stop there um, and and maybe open it up for some questions. Uh, Sam, assuming you're you're still there, there we go. Stay here. magical. And, and Matt, I'm wearing something very special for you. I, I, I did an outfit change here. Um, yes. <laughs> you see that, Matt? Quick, there we go. The right, like this is a fintech a collective quick. hat that is a unicorn with Stay Magical. And usually my usually this is my, my wife's go-to hat, but I, I stole it from her for this uh, special occasion. That, that's amazing. I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say, so Sam is a valued uh, ad, an advisor and investor in FinTech Collective. Um, early, early backer of Brooks and Gareth, who are the founders of our firm, my bosses, who uh, invested in Jason shortly before I joined, I joined the firm, so. Glad to glad to have it all in the fintech collective family here. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, we're we're trying to tr trying to do the full <laughs> Yale waterfall here from from investor to, to venture to to company. Um, yes, we, we we have a lot we have a lot of questions. I'm gonna try to get to all of them. Um, and Matt, on that last topic that you were discussing, which is really, you know, fintech 1.0 now transitioning to fintech 2.0. A question for, from Neil Holman here, who is a Davenport '91 go Davenport, um, which is you know. A lot, some of your peers, the, the early, that FinTech 1.0 cadre, the lending club on deck, when they transitioned from growth companies to finance companies, they had some stumbles, in particular stumbles in, in the, you know, in the public markets. Um, uh, Jason and Matt, can, can you guys talk about how this time, you know, and, and I know we, we, we've chatted about this, 
your, your views on on how this why this time is different, how this time is different, yeah. and some of the lessons learned from from, from that cohort. God, I love this so, question. It's, it's teed up perfectly. Matt, do you want to go first? You want me to go first? I'll give the quick answer from my perspective, and then Jason's going to give a far smarter answer. But for me, the quick answer is. When you look at a business and, and we debate about valuations, we're, we're thinking about the net present value of the cash flows of the business. And what really matters, what are the revenues, what is the gross profit and what is ultimately the profitability and what is the growth of that revenue and profit stream over time. So when you, whether it's a lending company, right, or a software company focused on manufacturing or um, you know, uh, beyond meat, right? Like this question of, is it, is it a tech company or not? Ultimately, it doesn't really matter. What matters is it, um, is it predictable revenue? Is it high growth revenue? And is it high margin revenue, right? And I think what we found with Lending Club and OnDeck um, was they grew really fast, but they, they had unit economics that may never have made sense because they were acquiring every customer at astronomical prices. And those prices to acquire the customer were going up and they weren't engaging or retaining the customer so the, the revenue wasn't really recurring or high engagement in, in nature. You look at a, a company like Moneyline in our portfolio, um, they offer lending, banking, wealth management. Um, they lead gen out to insurance products. They're building a platform and their customers are highly engaged with them. Almost half of their customers use multiple products on the platform. That's very different than, than Lending Club and what Jason is doing with embedded, Jason's doing with embedded distribution is very different. So, so is it a tech company? Is it a finance company? I don't think it matters, uh, personally. You know, I, I tend to agree with what Matt's saying. What I would say is this time is different, sort of, asterisk, but it almost <laughs> So what I, what I mean by that is what investors are buying is if you believe their narrative, will that business be valuable? In FinTech 2.0, it's different, sort of, is I think that revenue and even contribution are, are, are just metrics that you shouldn't look at primarily for valuation. However, I'm also kind of the EOR of FinTech. And so people always say, oh, you just shut up. We were gonna look at these revenue multiples. I think net income and adjusted operating cash flow and ROE are actually the right metrics, but it doesn't actually matter because what drives success in this business um, are kind of two things. The first one is cash is king. This is why this time is kind of different sort of, but doesn't really matter. Even if a firm takes way longer to achieve what they're trying to achieve, they have so much cash. And Max is like the Elon Musk of financial services. Then it almost doesn't matter because people will just throw money at him until it becomes true. And, and sad as that sounds, it's actually half the battle for these types of businesses. And so he has a mega advantage. The other thing that I'll say is partnerships in kind of proprietary origination channels are actually difficult to dislodge and huge competitive advantages. Um, some lenders will complain that when I call Walmart CEO, they don't call me back. Max calls Walmart CEO, they call back immediately. It's actually a huge advantage. The guy's a partnership monster. And so he has kind of an embedded advantage. And what I'll say is like, who knows, his current valuation implies a scale of his business that's unbelievably extraordinary. But if anyone's gonna do it, it's gonna be him. So I'm not gonna bet against him. The last thing I'll say is kind of going, rounding back to my first point, which is if you imagine if what they are selling becomes true, is that a valuable business? If Max, does what he says he's going to do, or if Better Mortgage does what they say they're going to do and they're kind of doing it, or if Klarna and Afterpay do what they say they're going to do, that business, you don't have to have much imagination. They're going to replace companies that already have market caps in the tens of billions because the profit pools are there because that asset is actually valuable. And so then it's just a matter of how much risk and how much time are you willing to do and do they have the cash to do it and, and cover up the mistakes they're inherently going to make? That's kind of how I would look at it to say this, this time is different sort of, yeah. but it kind of doesn't matter. It, there's another, there's one uh, real quick because we want to do more questions. There's another very important macro difference today, which is interest rates are at all time lows. When Lending Club was scaling, you know, five, eight years ago, um, they had a CAC problem. Their CAC went up tremendously. And then all of a sudden they had a hard time competing to be profitable against banks, which had zero cost of capital. Um, you know, with interest rates at zero in many countries negative um, and not changing for the foreseeable future, we, we're entering a much more favorable environment for non-bank non lenders. Yeah. I'm, I'm just muted there, guys. That, that was absolutely fantastic answer to that question. And it, it's, it's just super interesting, like, you know, my view in the public market and that idea that 
you know, Jason, you're looking at this, you know, you, the Eeyore of, 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 of FinTech, <laughs> you know, and, and yes, cash is king and, and making money is what really matters at the end of the day. And the public markets are saying the opposite a little bit right now. And it's challenging to navigate, um, you know, when, when you see these multiples on certain companies, but it's working. There's a, um, I, I, I think there's, a, there's really a bit of, um, you know, a, a virtuous cycle for some of these companies and sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy that ye who raises the most cash will succeed. Um, but at, at some point, it, I, I think it, it comes apart at, at, at some point at, at the end, you know, you, you, you have to have a real valuation. You have to have a, a defensible business. And you clearly built that. I think the point of sale model um, with the OEMs and also I would love to hear, I, I know you, you mentioned to me, you know, sort of the, the, the industry partnerships, not just the OEMs, um, but the industry partnerships that you made um, and some of the, the, the advertising, that you do, the marketing that you're doing on the web, I'd love to hear a little more about that and how you're using that to, to, to originate. A absolutely. So there are kind of two major avenues for how we acquire customers. So we have partnerships with manufacturers and dealerships and merchants generally, where they have their existing audience and we finance them. We also had this realization that if we were able to drive consumers to these merchants and drive incremental sales, um, by basically being able to provide a superior experience to consumers so they'd want to do that. And then also the merchants would reward us exponentially for that. Because whenever you grow the pie, you get overpaid for growing the pie as opposed to redistributing an existing pie. And so there's a kind of this interesting inefficiency that's currently exists in the market. And we're not the only space. And I wish I invented this, but we actually stole someone else's idea in another space. So this company Haggerty, which some of you might know from like specialty cars and stuff, they basically realized that these media companies, all of their revenue has gone from them <laughs> over the last decade to Google, Facebook. And so now these media companies that were printing money a decade or two decades ago have been in an accelerating slump. And many of them are actually now unprofitable. However, to Haggerty Insurance, if they were able to have this audience where they can convert even a small percentage to insurance policies, that, that the value of each of the audience members is like 10 to 15 X what these media brands were able to produce um, uh, based off uh, you know, effectively the, the advertising models that they have, right? Now, look, I, I don't want any of the specific information. I'm just looking from the outside, looking at what they did and making guesses of why they did what they did. And apparently it's been very successful for them. Inspired us, there is an equivalent brand available for purchase in our market. They were the leader, they're like the car and driver of our space called Cycle World, it was in a series of other properties. And they had the exact same problem. All of their revenue had kind of gone away over the last decade or so, you know, accelerating it as well. And there was an opportunity to acquire them at a very reasonable price. And we knew that these folks are the best content providers. They have this massive audience. They keep them engaged. And it's helping build the power sports space. This is a force for good. So we want to keep it going. But also the value of that audience is far more valuable to us than it is to any media company. So it was an inefficiency because only media companies were looking at buying them. And they can only make basically a fraction of what we can make per cons consumer audience member. And so it was just this amazing R. It would have cost us almost 15 times as much to build the equivalent audience, if it were even possible, because there's limits to what you can do through Google acquisition uh, to build our own brand. And it would have also, it also saved us about three years. And so we, we closed that acquisition in Q4, we're integrating it currently. Um, and kind of the early signs have been exceptionally promising. The reason why I bring this up is I believe that this trend will continue for at least the next five years before people get smart. And so the telltale times, signs of this is if you have a highly engaged audience in a niche that you could then monetize through either driving transactions. So let's say you own your own store so you could sell things to them or through the sale of like insurance or even lending products that are over the value that you'd get through normal advertising revenue through a media brand. Uh, I think will provide lots of interesting transactions over the next five years. In fact, when we did the transaction, we got called from several other people who like had similar ideas. They're like, oh, I want to do this in the like XYZ space. Tell me about how you did it. And it was, it was pretty interesting. No, it's, it's a re really great idea. It's, I mean, you know, use, using the content providers to be a channel for you know, to effectively, you know, customer acquisition channels were re really, really smart. Um, we're not going to be able to get all the questions. I'm going to try to mess a few of them from the chat all, all in one here. Um, reg regulatory environment, um, changes with the new administration. And then, um, you know, Tara Falcone is asking about 
kind of you know, the, the fee-less model, kind of commission-free fintech models, where really where data is the key. Um, you know, curious your, your view on the, on the data that you're providing. Is there value there? And I guess the regulatory the, the regulatory components to everything that's going on, and then also on on, on the data side. Absolutely. So data question is very interesting. Matt actually might have better thoughts than I on that one. Uh, on the regulatory side, we are not under the purview of the CFPB. We are we do sales finance, which is actually technically not lending. Also, because we're a secured lender and we're mostly prime and high near prime, our APRs are far lower than any of the people that you've heard of that are venture backed. And so we never really, so we don't even need to use an origination bank because the main reason you use an origination bank, uh, there's kind of three reasons. Um, so just, just so everyone knows, if you're getting a loan from Lending Club, it's originated by Web Bank. Well, not, actually, not anymore because they just bought a bank. But it was originated by Web Bank or Cross River Bank if you're on Prosper or if you're doing something through Avant or uh, I think even a firm, I think, uses them. But anyways, so basically what you're doing in that model is I need to charge an interest rate that's higher than the state cap. And unfortunately, if you're not a bank, you have a different state, regu you have to state by state regulations, really frustrating. And so to get around that, the first major advantage is the uniform regulatory environment, which is advantageous. And then second, it's mainly to export higher usury. So you partner with the Utah bank, which doesn't have usury caps, and you can basically have not usury caps anywhere. We don't need to do any of that because our APRs are far lower <laughs> because we're secured lending. We're mostly prime and near prime. So we don't need to do any of that. Um, and, and then because we're also sales finance, we're not under CFP, and we're also the subscale. However, we operate as if we were under the CFPV. And you know, we tend to look at kind of best practices generally, and we think the way in which we do business um, and, and the fact that we're on the lower side of interest rates, the things that are, that maybe others are worried about with like whether or not the origination bank model will hold is less of an issue for us. I would also say that the concerns about the origination bank holding, um, people were very concerned Matt in Midland, which was a case where basically, I, it was, I can't remember if it was Connecticut or New York, it was one of the states in the Northeast basically uh, said, no, you have to abide by our state law despite your export of charter. Um, there was a subsequent case, course, case in the last year or so where basically all the concern about Madden Midland, which people thought would bring down the origination bank model, also went away. So I, I would say for us, um, you know, we're, we're we, and well, the one other thing I'll say is the other place where people are concerned with CFPB is there's a lot of kind of on the edge underwriting tactics, which are using all sorts of new data that could be found to be discriminatory. We don't do any of that. We don't touch any of that either. So the, the hot button issues don't really apply to our business. Um, and so, and we tend to operate our business, you know, as if we were uh, under the, the, the highest levels. Great, that's perfect. Um, so it, um, John Fogelman has a few questions. Um, you know, LTV, um, you know, what, what's your loan to value? Um, what, and what type of spread are, are, are you generally taking? And then, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll ask you know, the, the, the composition between you know, w when you warehouse something, um, you know, what, 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 how are you sort of taking your loan portfolio and then securitizing it and, and getting it out there? What's sort of the overall, uh, you know, net interest margin? Yeah, absolutely. So our um, LTV varies by loan program, uh, of course. Our average on the non-prime book is about 95%. Our average LTV on the prime book is about 106. So you have to think of out the door LTV if you had zero down would be about 115, right? Because LTV the denominator is value of the vehicle. So you also have taxes, you have whatever accessories you're adding, you have all this other stuff. So you, that's why in auto and in our space, the average LTVs are oftentimes well over a hundred. Um, and then, you know, kind of average term on our, on our product is, is about a little more than 60 months. Um, we the average life about two years. Um, net interest margin, uh, I don't think I want to disclose on this call, uh, but basically the way you can think about it, between the subsidies that we're getting, we're, we're easily spreading uh, more than 2X what you would get for the exact same level of risk in auto. We're, the only thing I'll add is we're, we're looking, when we invest in lending, we're looking for founders that um, are really sharp on this capital markets question. Uh, the amount of a loan um, that can get advanced by whatever debt capital facilities you have will determine how much equity capital gets eaten as you grow your grow your loan book. And it can be a, a handcuff on the scalability of your business. So founders like Jason, I, um, the ones that do well have a really strong nose for how do I constantly increase my advance rate and reduce my cost of capital and, and have a clear plan on how to go down that path from the, from the get-go. 
on, on the cap market side, uh, our warehouse advance, so when we're balancing stuff before we securitize, ends up blending to mid to high 80s. Um, and we're usually, we blend to call it L3. Um, our last securization advanced through 98.2% and a blended cost of funds of 2.42% fixed. We expect our next securization to be inside of 1.5% cost of funds and we should advance through par, very close to par. Um, so we have just extraordinary excess spread relative to other assets. Um, and you know, we were able, uh, very proud to say, uh, we, I always try to hold myself up to a firm as the gold standard. We got to double A before they got to double A and you know, no, no, nothing's guaranteed. I think we uh, very high chance we'll have a major three on our next deal, which will just be our third transaction, uh, which is very early on in our, in our history. But that's because we've dedi we have the ability, we've performed exceptionally well and consistently and the capital markets and agencies have, reward, have rewarded us for that. I'm, I'm gonna ask one more question from the group. Then I have a final question. Then we'll, then we'll close up there. This is from, from Sechon, just on that. Um, good timing, she said, um, what is Octane's competitive advantage versus a firm or other lenders if they choose to enter the passion sports industry one day? Yeah, that's a great question. So in general, I, we have this great chart. It's literally every company you've ever heard of going after all the markets we don't ever want to go into. And then all of our markets where you have one or two players and that's it. Now, realistically, a firm already has too high of an average ticket price, right? They want to comp to Klarna on, on Afterpay whose average ticket's about one fourth of theirs because they're trying to claim that they're an alternative to credit cards, not a real lending company, and they're more of a payments business. And so realistically, strategically, a firm, at least for the next five to 10 years, is going to want to bring down their average ticket. Whereas we are the polar opposite. Our average ticket size is, about 10, is over 10K, so it's about 12,000. And we're going after markets that are even larger. Like our next space, which is Marine, which we're entering in the next couple of months, average ticket size will be 30 to 40K. So um, it's extremely unlikely that any of those players will want to go into after our space. Now, it's completely possible that someone who doesn't exist today will want to go in our space. Um, you know, maybe Fortress writes a 50 or $100 million check and tries to compete, but we're insulated from several means. First, um, we have the manufacturer partnerships, which are very difficult to dislodge. So something that's very difficult for people to understand is most companies can only deal with two or three financial counterparties. They don't want to have 50 counterparties, right, who are partners, because they're not, they're, their number one goal is a steady and reliable and high-performing counterparty, not to optimize price. And so because of that, they limit the number of partners they work with, and it's very difficult to get fired by a partner. You really have to screw up or piss someone off to get fired. And that's why these partnerships with Syncrete and all these other people stay for decades. And that's something that people, when they're always concerned about Peloton concentration, a firm would have to do something really crazy to get fired by Peloton. It's just not gonna happen, right? And for a firm to get dislodged, you have to be like 10X better than a firm. It's not better to, you can't just be a firm minus 50 basis points. That's not gonna get you the Peloton deal. You have to be materially better than a firm. And so you have to be 10X better than us, which is very difficult to do because we've already done all the tactics that you would do to be 10X better than the incumbents. So you'd be like hundred X better than the incumbents, which is just very challenging to get to that level and dislodge us. The reason why that's an important point is we're subsidized. Meaning that if you came to market without the partnerships and you tried uncrediting us on price, we're already subsidized. So that means you have to undercut our subsidized rates, which is really expensive. Then the second thing is data. So in all the big markets, I could call up Experian, Equifax, TransUnion and buy out all the loan performance for unsecured consumer, mortgage, auto, student lending, whatever, because the lenders report those loans as those asset classes. In our space, the lenders aren't reporting these loans as motorcycles, ATVs, UTVs, jet skis, snowmobiles, et cetera, et cetera, all of which perform radically differently. The implication of that is our performance data is actually way more of a moat than if you were in a big market, because only we are the only ones with the information on how each one of these assets perform, and the spread is wild. It could be 50% different losses, exact same credit profile between a sports bike and a UTV. And so if you don't know any of that information and exactly how to do that a type of underwriting, you're undercutting an already subsidized rate and then going blind into a highly volatile credit performance, which could also be extremely expensive. Then you would also have to somehow displace us at the merchant level, which is also very challenging and takes a ton of time and ton of money. And then in addition to that, we also now have the consumer business so in addition to having all of the data that helps support the moat on our, our credit business, and also the fact that we have our own uh, servicing and we know how to do all of that, et cetera, we have the, all the, the you know, kind of the experience built on, on secured lending, which is very unusual. Um, we also now have the consumer business. And as I mentioned, 
we just lucked into it that we were able to acquire this business at 2 million unique visitors in a space that's kind of small. So that's a pretty hot unique visitors a month. That's pretty high for the size of our market. You would then have to somehow figure out how to dislodge that, which would take multiple years and, and tens of millions of dollars. Um, and because we're sending these leads for more than just a rate, so it's, it's difficult to dislodge us. So we have multiple modes that kind of support each other that make it difficult for someone to enter. What I would say is, the other thing I'll say is like, <laughs> I literally, when we were a marketplace, I literally pitched every single private equity company that owned an auto originator or their auto company, portfolio company, and not a single one had any interest in entering the power sports market because one, they would rather just spend an extra 20 to $50 million in their existing market to grow. Two, it was like an entirely new business that they weren't interested in doing. And so it, it's, it's difficult for people to understand just how difficult it is to go into a new business or new vertical for lending. You think, oh, if I could do unsecured, I could do mortgage. It's not true. There's a reason why people have spent $100 million of equity into better or other companies to get an understanding of mortgage or unsecured consumer. And it's not everything doesn't translate as soon as you go into the next market, which is why there are, I can't think of a single, uh, with the exception of student lending to unsecured consumer, that's the only point where it's transferable. There's no other examples where they have, any of the fintechs have the same level of penetration in their home asset that they do in a second market. Perfect. That was really long-winded. I'm sorry, but I get that question. Oh, that was fantastic. <laughs> you're just a lot smart. You're just you're just very smart, Jason. You're you're, you're you're really guys. This is really fantastic. Um, I have one more question, which is a, a Yale-related question. And before I do that, I want to I want to um, mention on Feb 23rd, um, Accelerate Yale Yale Angels is sponsoring a pitch-off competition um, for young alumni companies, which is really going to be fantastic. It's for for underserved founders. Um, so Feb 23rd, um, please, please join us for that. We'll send some emails out to the, to the whole community, but it's going to be a great event. Um, last question is a Yale question, guys, for, for each of you. Um, what do you gain from Yale? What, what, what one thing or, or a couple of things that you got from, from your Yale experience um, that helped you get to where you are right now? Matt, you want to go first? Yeah. Um, you know, I, there's a a piece of me that's somewhat critical of higher education in that I, I think it's um, somewhat theoretical and a lot of what I'm doing today, like isn't taught in a college course and probably couldn't be, um, especially when it comes to being a FinTech specialist, um, understanding pretty complex markets, highly regulated. Um, um, but for me, the Yale, I wouldn't trade the Yale experience for anything in the world. And I don't think I would have been oriented the right way to figure out what I, what I want to do professionally without having had that, that experience first. So I studied sociology and economics. Um, I love both disciplines. Um, and obviously it's all about the people as well. Right. And so um, one of the, one of the great parts of Accelerate Yale is, um, I think it's a great way to continue the Yale experience, the Yale community, and for people who are like-minded and care about startups and technology and this sort of stuff, um, continuing that engagement is, is important because the Yale network is incredible. There, there are a few networks globally that are um, as deep um, or as meaningful as the Yale network. Um, and so I'm all for finding great ways to um, not only use the network, but continue to build the network even even after after Yale. What would you say, Jason? I, I would have a very similar answer. Um, one of the things that, that uh, I think really helped me, uh, I took a ton of seminars when I was in college and that sort of discourse uh, gave me the confidence to do pitching and public speaking in a way that I, I don't think I had before that. Uh, and I think that really made a, a huge difference. And then also, um, you know, the Yale community is exceptionally um, always willing to help. So, uh, so many cold LinkedIn messages always, almost always responded to, and so many so many people were willing to help me even though they didn't know anything about me. Uh, one of the things I encourage any anyone who's interested in running a startup is don't feel afraid to reach out and use your your, uh, you know, you, the fact that you went to Yale and Yale affiliation to get conversations with people that you have no idea who they, they they should not spend any time with you, but they would love to spend time with you. And that was exceptionally helpful getting Octane off the ground. A lot of our early investor meetings were set up that way. We got a ton of feedback that way. And then also, of course, uh, we, we were asking all the questions, um, trying to drum up business ideas to willing alums who are willing just to chat with us. 
Great, guys, everyone, um, thank you, Yale Finn. Thank you, Yale Alumni Association. Jason and Matt, guys, this was really, really amazing conversation. And thank you so much for, for doing this for us. And um, thank you everyone out there for listening. And uh, FinTech Collective, stay magical. Um, thanks <laughs> stay so much. Stay magical, everyone. Take care. Thanks for making it happen. This is great, guys. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you.